Hi folks, welcome back to the Tabletop's Edge and a tutorial of sorts today on the Avalon Hill Classic Empires in Arms. And I say a tutorial of sorts because this is not going to be an in-depth uh, rule section by rule section explanation of the rules. Instead, you can think of this as kind of a quick and dirty guide to Empires in Arms. The goal here is not to teach you how to play the game completely, but rather for players who have never played the game before or those who maybe have never even heard of the game to gain a working understanding of how the core systems in the game work. In other words, you'll learn how to conduct diplomacy, declaring war, suing for peace, how to move your armies and fleets across the map, how to supply them, and how to resolve battles. I'm going to try to keep this as short as I can. I'm aiming for about one hour, but I'm afraid it may go a little over that. So I'm not going to waste any more time, and we're just going to dive right in. Now, Empires in Arms is a grand strategic level game of the Napoleonic era. It spans the years 1805 to 1815, and players will each take control of one of the seven great major powers of the era. Great Britain, France, Spain, Prussia, Austria, Russia, or Turkey. Each turn represents one month of time passage, and the armies are represented in strength points, which equate roughly to about a thousand soldiers. Navies are represented by ships, which represent the larger ships of the line, with smaller transports and frigates being abstracted out of the game. Now that you've got a little bit of an idea of the scale and scope of the game, let's go ahead and uh, start off by looking at the components. Now the first thing you notice about any game really is the map, and so we will start there. Here you can see the map in its full extent. It covers Europe from the Atlantic here and the British Isles, down Spain to the northern coast of Africa, across to Egypt, up through the Levant and Turkey, the Caucasus, into European Russia, and you've got sort of southern uh, Scandinavia there. And the map is divided up not into hexes, but into areas. And let's zoom in and take a closer look to uh, kind of decipher what's on the map and how to read it. With a closer view of the map, you should be able to more clearly see the areas into which it is divided. Every area has a large number in it, and this number is the forage value. And we'll talk about that in more detail when we get to the supply rules. For now, though, just know that the higher the number, the better it is, and with the best forage value being a 6. Areas themselves are then grouped together into provinces, and provinces are denoted by these black borders and by the name. So, for example, here we have three areas that are grouped together and form the province of Burgundy. The numbers after the name of the province indicate the monetary income and the manpower income that the province generates every economic phase, which occurs every three turns. Most of the neutral minor countries in the game will be comprised of a single province. So, for example, you can see there's two areas here that form the province and minor country of Baden. Two more here for Württemberg. There's the Palatinate. Flanders is a bit bigger with four areas, but still all a single province. For the major powers, they are composed of multiple provinces, which you can see here in France. You have Burgundy, Champagne, Ile-de-France, Berry, and several others. Major power borders are denoted by this red or kind of pinkish uh, border. You can see there's France's eastern border. This uh, border over here is uh, the western border of Austria, and then uh, Prussia is off to the north there. Within each province, you have um, a capital, which is denoted by a city symbol and the city name being in red. So back to Burgundy here, we have two cities in the province of Burgundy, Lyon and Dijon. Dijon, however, is the capital as noted by its name being in red. And for the major powers, the capital of a major power is not only in red, but it is in all caps. So you can see here Paris and, for instance, London there for the capital of Great Britain. And you can also tell by these light green and brown areas that there are different types of terrain in the game. There are five types of terrain. The white areas are clear terrain, you have forest for the light green, and brown for the mountains. 
those comprise the vast majority of the uh, terrain you will see in the game. The other two types of terrain are marsh and desert. And for an example of marsh, we're going to go out here to uh, the east. And you can see here in Polesia, it's a little bit darker green than the forest areas here. And the deserts, as you might expect, are found down in Egypt here. And further west in Tunisia and Algeria. The last bit of terrain that I want to call your attention to are rivers. These are the blue lines here. Now, rivers always run along the borders of provinces, of areas rather. So in Champagne, there are three areas in Champagne with the river forming the uh, separating Metz's area from the area to the southwest. Rivers will only come into, will only affect things if you are moving um, your army across a river into an area where there is an enemy uh, core there. It will increase the cost by one to enter the area and it may affect the combat. Now, the only other thing you really need to be aware of on the map have to deal with uh, some naval aspects. So let's take a look at those. Now you can see there are sea areas here just that work just like the land areas. What I'm more interested in showing you right now, though, are these anchor symbols that you will see in some uh, land areas. These denote that there are ports located in that area and that you can base your fleets there. In order to move from the port into the adjacent uh, sea area, you will have to pass through this little box called a blockade box. These boxes have uh, some information in them that you're going to want to be aware of. The numbers at the top indicate the trade values. Uh, this is the amount of income that this port will generate each economic phase. The number to the left of the slash indicates how much uh, income it will generate for Great Britain, and the number to the right indicates how much income the port will generate for whoever controls the port. Below that is the name of the port, which will correspond to the land area in which the port is located. And then below that, the large number there, the 80, the 90, indicates the defensive value of the port. Should an enemy fleet attempt to attack one of your fleets that you have based in the port, you will use this uh, defensive value uh, to defend against their, uh, their attacking fleets. Now, in order to enter a port, you're going to have to move out into the blockade box and then into the sea area. Likewise, if you're in the sea area, you're gonna to have to move into the blockade box and then into the port. If you wish to blockade an enemy port, you will move your fleet and place it in that particular uh, blockade box, thereby forcing any enemy fleet that's in the port, if they wish to move out, they will first have to move into the blockade box with you and defeat you in a naval battle before they'll be free to move elsewhere. And with that, that's about all there is to the map here. You should uh, have no problem uh, when you uh, are looking over the map now, understanding what the uh, various symbols mean and, um, and then how to use them. So if you do forget, the map does have a very handy terrain effects chart printed right on it here in the upper left hand corner gives you all of the movement costs the land combat effects and uh, any relevant notes uh, that you may need so with that let's go ahead and take a look at the playing pieces there are five kinds of playing pieces that you're going to encounter in a game of empires and arms we're going to start with the strength point markers here on the right these are small half inch chits that you can see are basically labeled in numeric values. They are used to indicate the number of strength points of various types of soldiers that are present either on the map or within a, an army corps. If the uh, strength point marker is placed directly on the map, it will function as a garrison and it will, be, uh, it will default to an infantry type of strength point. There are... Um, several different types of strength points. You can have an infantry strength point, a militia strength point, which is denoted here with the marker that uh, says MIL at the top. You can have guard, which is a form of infantry, a, um, a very good form of infantry, cavalry and artillery strength points. At least France and uh, Russia are able to build artillery strength points. Now, 
if the strength point is on the map here, these strength points are immobile. They're on the map, they cannot move, they are essentially just garrisons, and they will be located either in cities or perhaps on supply depots. If you want to move and fight with your army, you are going to need to place your strength points into your army core, which are the next type of unit you will see here. These are larger squares. They're, I think these are half inch squares. These are three quarter or five eighths inch. And what I've laid out here is uh, a rubber, uh, sampling of the various army core for all seven of the uh, major powers. You can see Austria here, Russia, Great Britain, Prussia, France with both of these, Spain, and Turkey. And then finally, some of the neutral minor countries actually have core counters and fleets of their own. And you can see those will be gray with the name of the minor uh, country in, uh, in the pink stripe here. In addition to the national flag and color, you see a large number on the core counters. That is the movement allowance for the core. And as you can see, the, um, all of the core for the major powers except the French have a movement of three. The French infantry corps have movement of four. If it has a square flag, that denotes an infantry corps. If it has a pennant, like this core counter here, it's a cavalry corps, and it will have a movement of five. Most of the major powers have cavalry corps in addition to infantry corps. This is what you're going to see on the map for the most part. There's some limited or hidden uh, information, uh, limited intelligence in empires and arms. And the contents and the identity of the specific core are unknown to the enemy until they um, end up in a battle against said core. So you can find the information for the core on the back of the counter. When we flip this over, you'll see a large Roman numeral, which indicates the name of the core. In this case, we have the 6th Austrian Corps and the 4th French Corps. The values on the back of the core counter, you have in the upper left, the strategic value, or yes, the strategic rating of the inherent core commander uh, that's part of the, the game piece. In the upper right is the tactical rating for that commander. The lower left is the infantry morale level, and in the lower right is the cavalry morale level, if there are any strength points present. Now you can see the values do vary based on the nationality, and in some cases the type of corps that it is. If I turn over the French Cavalry Corps here, you'll see it is the 3rd Cavalry Corps, 3C. It has a strategic and tactical rating of 2. The dash for the infantry morale level indicates that this corps cannot contain any infantry strength points. It can only contain cavalry strength points, and they would have a morale level of 4. One more thing to note, on the minor country core counters, you can see some of them will have a parenthesis around their movement uh, allowance. That indicates that if the neutral minor country is being controlled by France, it, ha it will have a movement of four to match the French infantry corps. If it's controlled by anybody else, the movement is only three. And what you're going to do is you will be moving these core counters, you be able to stack them together, combine them into different areas, and they will be conducting your campaigns on the map. To the left of our core counters, we have some leader counters. Again, these are small uh, squares. The leader counters, let's see if I can zoom in here a little bit closer. The leader counters will be identified by the name of the leader, and they will have three numerical values and a letter on them. In this case, we have two French leaders, Bernadotte and Soule. The first number is the strategic rating of the leader, which corresponds directly with the strategic rating that we talked about on the um, core counter. The middle number is the tactical rating, again, which you, uh, corresponds to the number in the upper right on the core counters. And the number on the right is the number of core that this leader can command before suffering penalties to his strategic and tactical ratings. The letter indicates his rank. A's outrank B's, B's outrank C's, C's outrank D's, and so on. If you have more than one leader stacked together as part of an army, 
the leader's value that you will use, and you all use one leader's value for each battle, the leader's value that you use will be the highest ranking leader in the stack. So in this case, if Bernadotte and Sewell are stacked together, you're going to be using Bernadotte's ratings of two and two instead of Sewell's, which are three and three, which are better, simply because Bernadotte outranks Sewell. So that's something you're gonna to wanna to, uh, be mindful of as you are assigning your leaders to their armies. And we'll talk a little bit more about the tactical and strategic ratings, what they're used for, how you use them once we get to the uh, combat portion of the, uh, of the tutorial. Next, we have a supply depot. These supply depots are created and paid for by the major powers and placed on the map in various areas in order to supply uh, armies. There are two types of supply, and again, we'll talk about those when we get to the supply rules. So for now, just recognize that this is a, uh, this is a supply depot. And then finally, we have fleet counters. Fleet counters are similar to the core counters in that you will have the uh, national uh, color. In this case, we have the sixth uh, British fleet. The seven is the movement allowance. And below that, you can see an example of a neutral minor fleet, in this case, uh, Portugal's fleet, again, with a movement of seven. The backs of the fleets are blank because fleets are all the same. They have the same potential strength. So there is not nearly the type of differentiation as you see among the Army Corps counters. That's it for the amount of, uh, or for the various playing pieces you're going to uh, encounter in the game. What I want to do though, is I want to show you the national card that each of the major powers has because it will help better explain the relationship between uh, strength points and your army core. So let's take a look at that right now. One of the things that I think makes this game so great is that no two major powers armies are exactly alike. They're all different and they differ in varying ways. To help keep track of the, um, of the contents of each of your uh, Army Corps, every major power has their own display sheet here. And you'll see it's broken down into sections showing all of the Infantry Corps, all of the Cavalry Corps, and all of the fleets that can potentially be built. Now, each of these set of boxes here correspond to one of your core counters. Up here we have the fourth core, which would correspond to this counter here when it's on the map. Within the core, you can see there are three smaller boxes labeled infantry, militia, and cavalry, and there's a number at the bottom of those boxes. That indicates the maximum number of strength points that that particular core counter can contain. So in the case of the French 11th Corps, it can hold up to one cavalry strength point and up to 12 infantry and or militia. That's a combination of both. So you could have uh, four militia and you could have uh, then eight infantry. In this case, we see a, um, we could have seven infantry, four militia and one cavalry strength points. So the total number of strength points within this core would be 12, comprised, as I said, of seven regular infantry, four militia, and one cavalry. Now, not all of the French corps are the same size. You can see here at the Imperial Guard, you can uh, put uh, up to 20 guard strength points and three cavalry into that particular corps. France is one of two countries, along with Russia, that is able to build an artillery corps, which can contain up to 12 artillery strength points. And you can see up here, the first core is the largest single core actually in the game where it can hold up to 25 infantry or militia and three cavalry. Down here, you can see the cavalry core. France has four cavalry corps that she can potentially build. And each of them, the first and second can hold two, or I'm sorry, can hold up to seven cavalry strength points while the third and fourth can contain up to five. And again, this box here is going to correspond to this marker when it is on the map. The fleets, as you can see, all hold up to 30 ships and it's just a generic um, ship that you're, that you're building. They don't differentiate much between uh, types of ships. Now compare that to the Spanish national card here. 
And you can see instead of the 12 Infantry Corps and Imperial Guard and Artillery Corps that uh, Spain contains one, or can build one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight corps. And their corps tend to be a little bit smaller than the uh, French Corps with their largest corps holding 14 infantry uh, type strength points and up to two cavalry, and then they have a single cavalry corps. This is where you will keep track of the strengths of each of your core counters that are on the map. And then again, once uh, they get into battle, that's when we'll reveal the uh, strengths of the core involved and resolve the battle. And again, we'll talk about that when we get to the uh, land phase of the turn. So now that you sort of understand how the strength points work and in relation to the uh, to the core, we'll take a quick look at uh, how you win the game. How is victory determined and what do you need to be focused on as you're playing the game? Victory in Empires and Arms is determined through victory points. The first major power to reach its threshold for victory points will be the winner of the game. And because not all major powers are created equal, the threshold that they need to attain in order to reach uh, or claim victory are different. And I'll put those up on screen so you can take a look at those. France, being the uh, generally the most powerful individual country in the game, has the largest number of victory points uh, to reach in order to win. And uh, I believe it's Turkey there has the, uh, has the least amount. Now, how do you get victory points? Every three months, every three turns in the game, there will be an economics phase. In the economics phase, not only do you collect money and manpower and build reinforcements and replacements, but you will also collect victory points. How many victory points you collect is determined by where your country's political status marker is on this political status display. You can see in each box, there's a large number that we'll get to in a minute and a small number up top. That small number up top indicates the number of victory points that you will receive in the current economics uh, phase. So France down here with their marker in this box would receive nine victory points. Austria being in this box on the political status display in this case would get six victory points. Russia, being a little further up the track, would receive seven victory points. Now, you can see the track is divided into sort of four rows, and these are different zones, ranging from the fiasco zone to the instability zone, the neutral zone, into the dominant zone. As a player, you are going to want your country in the dominant zone as much as possible, and you want to avoid the fiasco zone uh, if at all feasible. The maximum number of victory points you can achieve in a single uh, economics phase is 15, and that is if you are maxed out on this chart. And it ranges all the way down to zero if you're in the fiasco zone. And if you're in the fiasco zone, you'll probably have a few other problems in addition to not getting many uh, victory points. Now, how does your marker move up and down these tracks? That's by gaining political status points. There is a long list of uh, different events or actions that will either gain or take away uh, political status from you. And we'll go over that, uh, I think, when, um, when everyone arrives for the game. It's located on the back of the uh, rulebook chart, but suffice it to say that Winning battles, winning wars is good and will get you more uh, political status as well as controlling minor countries. Losing battles, whether they be naval battles or land battles, losing wars, losing territory, uh, that is going to cause you to slide further down the political status display. So when you are thinking about what you want to do in the game, you always want to have one eye on the political status display and what effect your actions are going to have on where you're going to be located here. The last thing I want to say about the political status display right now is just this large number that ranges from a minus three to a plus three. After each uh, major power has collected their victory points for the turn, your marker is going to move in this either to the left if it's a negative, or to the right if it's a positive number. And the effect of this is that this chart is going to drive you 
two, these two boxes here in the neutral zone where you're not going to move. So as an example, uh, after Russia collects her seven victory points, the political status adjustment is a minus one. So she will move one box to the left and place her in this zero box. France, up here, after she collects her nine, she is going to move two boxes to the left. So she will move one here, and then she will move down into the neutral zone, where if she is unable to uh, gain any political status points over the next three turns and move back up into this track, she will be stuck here uh, getting only eight victory points as opposed to the nine that she got uh, last time. So Empires in Arms is a game that's going to force you to continually go out and be aggressive and try to gain as many political status points as you can because it is constantly pushing you back down towards towards the middle here. And if you sit here in the middle, certainly as France, you are not going to uh, be able to garner enough victory points in order to meet your threshold for victory. So with that said, let's get into the sequence of play. We'll start uh, to learn how exactly you play the game turn to turn. Each turn in Empires and Arms has four phases. There's a political phase, a reinforcement phase, a naval phase, and a land phase. And then every third turn, there will be an economic phase tacked on at the very end. And we'll talk about, I guess, each of the uh, phases and what you do in sequence of play order. That'll give you a feel for how the turn unfolds. And we'll talk about them in more detail shortly, but right now I'm just going to give you a kind of a brief overview of each of the phases. You'll start off each turn with the political phase. This is where you will conduct diplomacy with other players. This is where you declare war, where you sue for peace, where you form alliances, and take control of minor countries. After that will be the reinforcement phase, where everyone will place the uh, reinforcements, the strength points that they had built in previous economic phases, they'll either place them directly into their army corps or fleets, or they'll place them on map as garrisons. After that is the naval phase, where you will, as it sounds, conduct all your naval activity, sailing your ships, fighting naval battles, blockading enemy ports, etc. And then finally, there's the land phase. This is where you will move and fight with your armies across the map, and then finally, every third turn will be the economic phase. And this is where you will collect your money and manpower and spend that on building uh, reinforcements and replacements for your armies. So now let's take a look at each of the individual phases in a little more detail. The first step in the political phase of every turn is the diplomacy step. And this is where players will engage with one another, talk to each other, uh, where you're trying to uh, form alliances, maybe cut some deals, discuss plans of campaign for the upcoming turn or maybe the upcoming season. It's really kind of wide open. It's one of the more enjoyable aspects of the game. And when the diplomacy step is finished, the next thing you're going to do is declare any and all wars that you are going to announce for this turn. Each player will secretly record all of their declarations of war, and then they will be revealed simultaneously. After wars are declared, players will have the opportunity to call on their allies to join them. So, for instance, if, Fran if uh, Prussia and Austria are allies and France declares war on Prussia... Prussia will have the opportunity to call on her ally Austria to join the war against France. Now, Austria can either accept the call, at which point she will be considered also at war with France, or she can decline. However, if Austria declines the call to her ally, she will have uh, broken the alliance, and that's going to cost her some political status points. After the call to allies step is completed, then comes the peace step. This is the only time at which wars may end. And there are a couple of different ways for wars to end. First is an informal peace. This is where the two players that are at war just kind of get together and uh, agree not to continue fighting one another. They, they go to peace. There are no conditions on either side. There's nothing that's enforceable. They simply declare, hey, the war's over. We are no longer at war with one another. This does not prevent you from turning around and declaring war on that same major power the very next turn, if you'd like. It's just an informal um, ce uh, cessation of hostilities. So the other uh, way to end a war is 
through a formal piece. There are two kinds of formal pieces. There are conditional pieces and unconditional pieces. If the war is going badly for a particular power, they may decide it's in their best interest to go ahead and surrender to their opponent, and they would sue for peace at this point. The other power has three options. They can decline the offer to end the war and continue fighting, or they can offer a conditional peace. If they offer a conditional peace, the country that sued for peace must accept the conditional peace. The third option is to offer an unconditional peace. And the country that is trying to surrender then has the option to either accept the unconditional peace, which can be uh, pretty harsh, as you might imagine, or they can decline that and continue to fight on. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the peace step. Actually, why don't we do that right now, uh, just to give you an idea of what's involved in a conditional versus an unconditional peace. Every time a formal peace is decided upon, you're going to be consulting this victory conditions chart. Now, don't be confused. This is not victory conditions as in uh, winning the game victory conditions. These are victory conditions that pertain to the war that is just uh, that is about to end. If it is a conditional peace, the loser of the war will get to select one of the five options here under list A, and the victor in the war will get to select two options from list B on this side of the chart. Now, the list A options basically cancel out one of the uh, list B options. So if you are concerned about not wanting to pay reparations to the victor, as the loser, you would select option A2, needn't pay reparations, which, as you can see on the chart here, it says cancels B3, which is uh, the victor's option to pay reparations. An unconditional piece, the loser doesn't get to make any selections. The victor gets to choose three options from list C. Now, these options range anywhere from uh, ceding provinces to the victor to removing large portions of the loser's army from the map, paying reparations to them, also allowing the victor access to your country where they can garrison portions of the country, or maybe even using one of the loser's army corps on loan for a period of time. This game has a lot of options. Basically, if it could be done historically, they've got an option to represent that here in the game. And the peace step may sound a bit complicated, but uh, it's much easier once you actually see it in action. And I will say that um, in this game, most or many of the major powers will probably end up surrendering in a war at one time or another. It is not a game-ending event if you end up surrendering. Oftentimes, it can be a better option for you to just go ahead and bite the bullet, surrender, live with the terms of the peace that are imposed on you rather than continuing to fight on in a, uh, in a losing war. Now, after the uh, peace step, then alliances are formed. Any minor countries that were declared war on need to be controlled by a major power. And you also have the opportunity to break an alliance if you so desire. Following that, minor countries, uh, there is a free state declaration. A minor country can either be controlled as a conquered minor country, or you can set it up as a free state, which is basically kind of like a, a client state. Uh, the reason you would do this would be that some of the minor countries uh, have their own armies and fleets. A conquered minor country will not place any of those units on the map. Instead, its money and manpower goes directly to the major power for use. If it's a free state, however, it gets to keep a portion of its um, money and manpower, and it can use that to build its own forces, which will give you, in turn, more units on the map with which to uh, fight your wars. And then finally, the last thing in the political phase is allies can declare that they are going to move at the same time. When we get to the naval phase and the land phase, every major power will move in a certain set order. However, you can, if you are waging a coalition war against somebody else, it may be in your best interest to move at the same time as your ally or allies do. And in, if that's the case, you're going to want to announce that here at the end of the political phase. Now let's talk a little bit about the reinforcement phase. 
Now, before we uh, look at the reinforcement phase, I just want to mention a couple of things you need to be aware of when it comes to declaring war. Generally speaking, you are unrestricted in your declarations of war. You can declare war on um, any major power, neutral minor country, and as many of them at the same time as you desire. However, there are four restrictions to that that you need to be uh, that you need to be aware of. First, you cannot declare war on a country that you currently have units in. So if you have any garrisons, army corps, Cossacks, guerrillas, Fry Corps, anything like that in the target country, you cannot declare war on them. Second, if there are any enemy units currently in your home country, you cannot declare war. If the bad guys are roaming around your homeland, you've got enough problems as it is. Third, you cannot declare war on a neutral minor country if it's impossible for you to physically enter that country this turn. Now, how might this come up? Maybe uh, it's a minor country that is across the Mediterranean or across the, uh, the Baltic and you have no ships currently on map to transport your army there, there's no way for you to uh, reach that minor country, so you cannot declare war on them. And the fourth restriction is if you are under an enforced peace. Anytime there is a formal peace to conclude a war, there is a default period of time of 18 months where the two powers that came to peace cannot declare war on one another. There are a couple of options in the, uh, a couple of conditions in the peace conditions list that can extend that beyond 18 months. So just know, and that's another reason why you may want to go ahead and surrender and end a current war, because by doing so, you can uh, guarantee yourself of a little bit of a breathing space before you're going to find yourself at war with this particular power again. So those are the four restrictions on declarations of war. Now that you've got understand those, we can move on and take a look at the reinforcement phase. The reinforcement phase is exactly what it sounds like. This is when reinforcements that you have built in previous economic phases are placed onto the map, either into fleet counters and army corps counters or directly on the map as garrisons. The first step is the naval reinforcement step. The second step is the army reinforcement step. And reinforcements are placed in a specific country order in each of those uh, steps. So for the naval step, which comes first, the order of reinforcements are Spain, France, Prussia, Austria, Turkey, Russia, and finally Great Britain. Now, this is also where you'll have the opportunity to place any fleet markers that you have purchased on map as well. All the naval reinforcements are placed in a port in your home country or a conquered minor country that you control. So if Britain had purchased this fourth fleet counter in an earlier economic phase, they could place it on map in any port in their home country here. In this case, we're going to place it in Yarmouth. We already have the second and third fleet as an example here. And you can see on our national card that there are five ships in the third fleet and we have 25 ships in the second fleet. Now, when a fleet or core counter is purchased, it's purchased empty. You're going to need to fill it with um, strength points or ships. There are two ways to do that. You can place reinforcements, brand new ships or troops that you've built into that empty core counter, or you can transfer points between fleet counters that are stacked together. So in this case, if Britain does not have any ships arriving as reinforcements this phase, they could, because they are stacked together, they could simply take five ships from the second fleet and place them into the fourth fleet counter. Similarly, if they did have maybe two ships that they've built, they could then also place two ships into any of their fleets that are located in, uh, in one of their ports. And that's basically it for naval reinforcements. Now, let's take a look at the land reinforcements. Continuing on with the army reinforcement step, this too has an order of reinforcements by country, and it differs from the naval uh, sequence. For the army, it's Spain, then Britain, then Prussia, Austria, Turkey, Russia, and finally France goes last. Obviously, being later in the sequence allows you to see what the other countries ahead of you have reinforced and where they've reinforced, which will help give you a 
more informed decision when you go to place your reinforcements. Now, you can place your army strength points, be these infantry, militia, cavalry. You can place them in any city in your home country, and they would be uh, considered garrisons. So if the Great Britain had built one infantry strength point this turn, they could place it here in Portsmouth on map with the marker, and there would be one garrison in Portsmouth. Or you can place the uh, strength points directly into any core counter that is within your home country. So in this case, we have the British Third Corps in London. It currently has five militia strength points and five infantry strength points. Its maximum capacity is 14. So we could instead place our one reinforcing infantry strength point into Third Corps, which would now raise the strength of this core to 11 total, six infantry and five militia. Now, unlike fleets, which must be in port to receive new ships, you've got a little more flexibility in adding reinforcements. You are not limited to just cities in your home country or core that are located in your home country. In addition to being able to place your army reinforcements into your home country, you can also place the strength points directly into any of your core counters that are in or adjacent to one of your depots, as long as that depot is forming part of a valid supply chain, which leads back to a supply source in your home country. And I'll talk about the definition of a supply chain when we get to the supply rules shortly. And what this does in effect is allow you to place your reinforcements directly at the front, as it were, rather than having to place them in your home country and march them all the way out. And that's pretty much all you really need to know uh, about the reinforcement phase to, uh, to get started in the game. So let's go ahead and move on to the naval phase. In the naval phase, there are basically two steps. You are going to do your naval movement and then do any naval combat. And just like the reinforcement phase, naval movement is done in a specific major power order. Russia first, then Turkey, Austria, Prussia, France, and finally Spain. Great Britain gets to choose where in the order she wants to uh, wants to move her fleets. And this decision is made on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. So this turn, Britain could decide they want to move first. Next turn, they could decide to go last. You get the idea. Now, when it comes to naval movement, each sea zone entered costs one movement point, And you can see all fleets have a movement of seven. To enter a sea zone adjacent to a port from a port costs one. If you're in the sea zone to enter the port, it also costs one. So with the third fleet here, Great Britain could sail out for one. They could sail up here for two. And then they could enter the Newcastle port for three movement points. It's just that simple. Now, while you are moving, you are subject to being intercepted by enemy fleets. If, for example, the French First Fleet were to sail out of Antwerp into this sea zone, the British, who are at war with France, could attempt to intercept the fleet with any of the fleets that are either in the sea zone or adjacent to it. And a port that borders a sea zone is considered to be adjacent to the sea zone. In order to successfully intercept from an adjacent sea area, you need to roll a one or less on a uh, six-sided die. Anything over one, and the moving fleet continues moving on. If you are intercepting with a fleet that is in the same sea zone, if the second fleet for Britain were located here instead, when the first French fleet sails out in the same sea zone, you would need to roll a three or less. These fleets in port here would still need to roll a one or less. If the interception is successful, you will fight a naval battle immediately, as opposed to waiting until the uh, naval combat step. If the moving fleet wins the naval battle, they will continue moving as before. If they lose the battle, they will have to retreat just as if they had lost a, a regular naval combat. Speaking of naval combat, let's go ahead and show you how that works. Naval combat in Empires in Arms is a very simple two-step process. Let's say, for example, that we have the British Second Fleet fighting a combat against the French First Fleet. The first step is to determine the wind gauge. Both players will roll one d6 and the high roller gets the wind gauge. What does that mean? That means that when you make your attack rolls, 
the player with the wind gauge will inflict losses on the other side before the other side gets to shoot back. Normally, combat is going to be simultaneous in Empires and Arms, but if you can get the wind gauge, it becomes sequential rather than simultaneous. And that matters because after determining the wind gauge, both players will roll another D6 and consult the naval combat chart here. Whatever they roll, you will see it gives you a percentage loss. This is the percentage of the rolling player's fleet that the target fleet will lose. So if the British fleet had 20 ships in it and he rolled a two, you see 10% loss. 10% of 20 is two, which means the French fleet would then lose two ships. The French player has also rolled his die, and if he also has 20 ships, but he rolls a five, you can see that's 20%. 20% of his 20 is four ships, so the British would end up losing four ships in the engagement. The winner of a naval battle is the side that lose that loses the fewest ships. So I guess another way to look at it is the loser is the side that loses the most ships. When that happens, the loser must retreat to the nearest unblockaded friendly port. In this case, we'd say the uh, if the um, British lost because they suffered four ships as opposed to only two ships for the French, they could retreat to either Hull, which is located on this sea zone, Yarmouth, or London. If they go to London, the French fleet then has the option as the winner of the battle to pursue them, and they would occupy the blockade box here, essentially blockading the losing fleet in the port. And I want to talk a little bit about the uh, blockade boxes here. It's possible in Empires and Arms to blockade enemy ports, and you will do so by moving one or more fleet counters into the blockade box for that particular port. Now, in this case, we have a French fleet that is in the port of Amsterdam, and the British have moved two fleets into the Amsterdam blockade box here. What this means is the French fleet will be unable to move out of the port without being intercepted in the blockade box. By placing your fleet in the blockade box, you automatically successfully intercept any fleet that is attempting to move out of the port into the sea zone. So you can see where this would be very handy for somebody like Britain who is seeking to keep the French fleets from carrying Napoleon's armies onto, uh, onto England. They will be unable to avoid the English fleets that are located in the blockade boxes of their, uh, of their ports. Now, you can do more than simply blockade the port. You can also attack fleets that are um, at port anchored and to do so, you have to be in the blockade box and you simply state that you're going to attack the port. However, before and that the, the port battle is resolved exactly like a naval battle at sea with one exception. Every port has a defense value. In this case, Amsterdam has 80. This represents the port defenses that will attack the attacking fleet before the regular naval combat is resolved, and that 80 represents the number of ships. So where we rolled the die and took the percentage losses, we do the same thing here with the port defenses. If the French were to roll a two and get 10%, 10% of 80 would be an eight ship loss to the British fleet before the British fleet and the French fleet would engage in combat. Now, any fleet that is attacking a fleet in harbor automatically gets the wind gauge. So then the, the combat would uh, be sequential once the uh, attacking fleet attacked the, uh, the French here. The one catch about port defenses is you can only use port defenses if you have a garrison in the port. So without a garrison factor there, you're not going to be able to, uh, to use those defenses and the British fleet would be able to sail in and attack the French fleet directly. That's um, pretty much the uh, quick and dirty on how naval combat and naval movement works in, uh, in EIA. It's a fairly simple, straightforward process. The British 
to reflect the superiority of the Royal Navy at this time period, do have some advantages. They get a plus one when it comes to the wind gauge roll, which means many times they will get the wind gauge and, and um, be able to inflict losses on their opponents before their opponents are able to, uh, to fire back at them. Now, once the uh, last major power has conducted all of their naval movement in combat, the turn then moves on to the land phase, and this will take probably the biggest chunk of each turn. So let's take a look at how the land phase works. Now in the land phase, just like the naval phase and the reinforcements phase, each major power is going to conduct their activities in a certain order. And for the land phase, the order is Russia first, then Turkey, Austria, Prussia, Great Britain, and then Spain. France, just like Britain did in the naval phase, gets to select where in that order she wants to conduct her activities. So again, she could decide to move first this turn. Next turn, she could decide to move after Austria and before Prussia. Now, what do you do when it's your country's turn to conduct your land phase? The first thing you're going to do is depot creation and removal. When it comes to removal, you simply pick the depot up off of the map you, because it's no longer useful for you and you return it to your uh, supply. You can then pay to place that depot back on the map at a later point in time. Placing depots or depot creation, you can place a depot in any city in your home country. You can also place depots outside of your home country, but it must be in an area in which you currently have an unbesieged army corps. So the French have two infantry corps and a cavalry corps located here in Stuttgart. They also have another infantry corps up here in the uh, adjacent space. They could place this new depot in either of these two spaces. The depot not only has to go into an area where you currently have an army corps, but it also has to form part of a supply chain. And we mentioned this back in the reinforcement phase. Supply chain starts in a supply source, which would be a city in your home country, and you uh, place a depot in that city. You can then place a depot up to two areas away, and they will be considered chained together. You can continue doing this all the way across the map, and in some instances you may be forced to do so. It's the only way to uh, form a supply chain. The enemy, however, can cut your supply line by moving enemy forces in between the two uh, depots that have formed the chain. So from Stuttgart to this space here, you can see there's Ulm and then this space. This is a valid supply line right now. If, however, the Austrians had placed, managed to get an army corps into this space here, and the Russians had an army corps in Nuremberg, you can see now there's no way to trace from this depot back to another depot that is in supply back to the home country. So these French corps would not be able to use depot supply when it comes to the supply phase. They would be forced to uh, forage off of the land. Now, after you create and remove any of your depots, you then move your units and you will move your army corps individually. So even though I have a stack of three corps located here, when I go to move them, I will be moving them individually. You simply move them into adjacent spaces, paying the movement point cost until you run out of your movement allowance. Now, let's take a look at the uh, core here in Metz, for example. If I'm going to move him, I can move him into Lorraine. It is a forest area, so that's going to cost two movement points. I can then move him into this area of the Palatinate for three, and then across into Baden here for four, at which point he would be done moving, unless I choose to force march him. I can get one additional movement point if I force march. Now the downside of force marching is that if you are using forage supply, it's going to give you a bad modifier and increase the chances that you will suffer some attrition losses 
uh, from supply by force marching. Now, if a unit, if a corps enters an area which contains only a garrison or only an enemy corps that is inside the city, you have a choice. You can either stop and besiege the enemy units or you can continue moving on. So that would be one, two, three, four. If, however, you enter a space, an area, if we go here for one, two, three, that contains an enemy core that is not in a city, you must stop your movement for the turn. And then I would continue moving. I would, could move this core in to basically reinforce the coming battle here. After all of my movement, we would then conduct supply. There are two ways to supply units, and let's talk about those here briefly. One thing we haven't talked about yet is how do I move my Army Corps across sea areas to reach islands? How do I get the British Army off of, out of England and over to the continent, say? It's fairly simple and straightforward. Each fleet counter can transport one core counter. It doesn't matter how many ships are in the fleet. You could have one ship in that fleet. You can have 30 ships in that fleet. It can still carry a core counter. And again, it doesn't matter if there's a single strength point in that Army Corps or if there are 28 strength points in that Army Corps. The Corps and the fleet have to start in the same area at the start of the naval phase. The Army Corps embark on the fleet, and as the fleet moves out, they will remain on the fleet until the fleet reaches either a blockade box or a port. Now, one thing that's very important to remember is the Army Corps will debark from the port if, if the fleet does not sail into a friendly controlled port at the, end, at the end of its movement. It will debark from the fleet at sea or in the blockade box during the land movement step. If it does not successfully debark, the Army Corps will be destroyed. So you cannot leave Army Corps at sea for more than a single turn. Also, if the French were to sail out and successfully intercept the British fleets sailing here, and they were to sink an, enough ships to destroy one of the two British fleets, then the excess ground units being transported would also be destroyed. When a when an army corps debarks from either a sea zone or a blockade box, it will enter the uncontrolled or the enemy controlled area and it will be treated as if it had crossed a river as far as combat goes. Now that's about all you really need to know for transporting land forces across the sea zones. Now we'll pick back up with where we left off. There are two ways to supply your army units. The first is regular supply or depot supply, and the second is forage supply. Let's talk about uh, depot supply first. With depot supply, all you do is simply pay money for each core in order to supply it. The amount you have to pay depends on how far the core is from a supply uh, a depot that is part of a valid supply chain. If it is in the depot's area, it costs you one half dollar. If it is in an adjacent area, like this core here for the depot in Stuttgart, it would cost one dollar. If it's two unblocked areas away, like the core up here in the forest, it's going to cost two, and if it's three away, it will cost three, and that is per core. So if the French were to uh, want to supply all uh, five of the Army Corps you see on the map here with depot supply, they would have to pay one half, one and a half, and then two, four, six for a total of seven and a half dollars of their uh, out of their treasury in order to supply those core. If they can do that and decide to do that, then those core are fully supplied and they do not have to worry about any attrition losses. The second method of uh, of supplying your troops does not cost you any money, but it will involve some dice rolling, and that is forage supply. Let's take a look at how forage supply works. Forage supply is uh, resolved immediately after each individual core uh, completes its movement. And the procedure works this way. If this French core starts here in Lyon, 
and moves into the mountains for two movement points and then Turin and then ends up in Milan for four movement points. You uh, and announces it is going to use forage supply. You then look at the forage value of each area that it entered, not counting the area it began the move in, and you're going to use the lowest of those. So even though the core ends up in Milan with an excellent forage supply value, the lowest that it entered were the mountains here next to Piedmont with a two. You're then going to roll one D6, and if you roll equal to or less than the forage value, then no losses. For every pip over the forage value, you are going to lose one strength point from that core. And there are a couple modifiers to that die roll. First, for every additional core that is in the space that you end up in, you're going to add plus one to the to the die roll. And that doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it's friendly or enemy. So if, on the other hand, the core had uh, entered uh, the forest here for two and then moved into Zurich to fight the Austrians here. It's three here and it's three there. So it doesn't matter which forage value we use, it's going to be three because there is an additional core, the Austrian core in this case, in this area. We're going to add plus one to the die roll. If you force marched, at all to get that one extra movement point. If instead the French player decided to move here for two, here for four, and force marched to get into Zurich, giving him five movement points, you can see we're going to be using the two forage value. You would add plus one for the force marching to your die roll. You would then have to add a second plus one for the Austrian core there. So they're looking at a net plus two to the forage die roll which means even if they roll a one on the die, they're going to get no better than a three, which means they will lose at least one strength point, potentially up to six strength points from this core due to, uh, due to forage. You can also uh, reduce the, uh, there are some negative modifiers that lower your die roll. For every unspent movement point, you get to subtract that from the forage roll. So if the core decides to move into the mountains here and move no further, it's only used two movement points. It would roll the die and it would subtract two from it and it would be looking to roll a net two or less to avoid any, um, any attrition losses. Also, if you begin and end your movement within territory that you control and move completely within territory you control, you get to subtract one from the uh, forage roll. In winter, everyone will add plus two to the forage roll. So it is very difficult to forage during the winter. And that winter covers pretty much the entire map except the, uh, the very northern coast of uh, Africa along the southern edge of the map. That's basically how foraging works. You're going to see though that because of the number, because the number of core in the area where you end up is going to have a, a negative or a, a bad effect on your foraging attempts, you're going to want to keep your uh, armies spread out as much as feasible to, uh, to prevent a bunch of attrition losses. Of course, the flip side is you also need to concentrate to those army corps in order to um, in order to defeat the enemy army. So it's a delicate balancing act when you're dealing with forage supply. If you've got the money for it, just use depot supply and uh, pay the pay the cash, and uh, you don't have to worry about that situation. That's how supply works in uh, empires and arms. There are a couple of um, unusual situations, for instance, if a, uh, if a core is in a port. Let's take a look at sea supply and um, besieged supply. Now, it's possible to trace supply across the sea. In order to do this, you'll need a depot in, in a port on each side of the, uh, of the sea that you're tracing across, and you will need at least one fleet from your major power or an ally major power in one of those ports that happens to be a supply source. So in this case, the British Corps here on the continent can trace a supply 
line basically back to the depot here in Amsterdam. He can go across uh, to England with sea supply because of the fleet he has here stacked with the depot in the other port. Now, enemy fleets at sea here cannot block this sea supply. In order to block the sea supply, the enemy fleet would have to be in the port's blockade box. That would then sever this supply chain. Now, if a, a, a core is in a port city, even if it's besieged by enemy troops, you can still build a depot in this port so long as this sea supply chain is not, uh, is not broken. One other way you can supply uh, troops that are across the sea is invasion supply, and that would be creating a depot on a fleet that is at sea. This depot then can supply any core that is in an area that is adjacent to that uh, to that sea zone, but only in the areas that are directly adjacent to it and not any further inland. Now, how does supply work for units that are besieged. In an example here, we have this poor single Austrian corps holed up in the city of Stuttgart being besieged by four French army corps. The Austrians, when it comes to supplying their corps, must use forage supply. They cannot use depot supply. The forage value that's going to be used are the number of spires in the city. So in this case, three spires, the forage value for the Austrian corps would be a three and then you would roll the die looking for a three or less to avoid any attrition losses. Now for the besieging units, for their supply, they can use depot supply if they are within range of a depot that's part of a supply chain, or they can forage. If they forage, it works just, uh, just as normal, except that they cannot subtract their unused movement points from the uh, uh, from the forage rule. So they get no credit. If, even though they remain in the area and don't move, this French Corps would not be able to subtract four when he makes his forage rule because he is busy besieging the enemy corps in the city. Now, that's basically it for, uh, for supply. Let's move on to the interesting stuff here, uh, land combat. After a player has finished moving all of his units and resolving the supply of those units, if any of his forces are in the same area as enemy forces, a battle will be fought. And in this particular example, Marshal Sewell has three French corps in the same area, Stuttgart, as Archduke John and his single Austrian corps. So there will be a battle fought here. Marshal Bernadotte is in an adjacent area with a cavalry corps and another French infantry corps. And we'll talk about why that is significant shortly. Now, the first decision that has to be made when resolving combat is by the defender. Is the defender going to remain in the field and fight this battle? Or if there is a city present, he has the option to withdraw into the city. However, he can only withdraw as many troops into the city as the city's capacity. In this case, Stuttgart's three spires means it can hold up to 15 strength points. If the strength points in the Austrian core exceed 15, the core cannot retire into the city at all. You cannot split up a core at this point and decide to um, have 15 strength points retreat into the city and leave the remaining two or three out to, uh, to fight the battle. It's all or nothing when it comes to core in this instance. If, however, the core has less than 15 strength points total, it could retire into the city with the leader and the French would then be placed on top to begin a siege of the city. Now we're going to assume that in this instance, the core is not going to retreat and we are going to fight a field combat. There are several steps involved here, but you'll see there uh, it's not necessarily a difficult process. It's actually one of the more interesting and fun parts of the game. Um, and uh, battles usually, especially big battles, will draw the attention of all seven players as they see uh, how it unfolds. So let's talk about uh, the different steps involved in resolving field battles now. 
First step in resolving any field combat is for both sides to choose an operational possibilities chit, which sounds a lot more complicated than it actually is. I prefer to just call them tactics chits. There are six gray chits for the defender to choose from and five white chits for the attacker to choose from. Both players will make their selection uh, secretly and then they'll be revealed simultaneously. However, once both players have made their selection, both players need to announce whether or not they have selected the outflank tactic because if one of the players has selected the outflank tactic, then that player is going to have to split up his forces into a pinning force and an outflanking force. You must have at least one core in the pinning force and all your leaders, and you must have at least one core in the outflanking force. So if Sewell were to choose the outflanking chit and John did not choose that, then of his three core, he would need to leave at least one as the pinning force with which he would remain, and the other two could act as the outflanking force, or he could leave two as the pinning force and one as the outflanking force. Why this matters is that the outflanking forces will not be involved in the battle until a successful role is made by the commander for them to arrive and reinforce the battle after the first or second rounds of the, uh, of the fight. And if Sewell were to send two core on the outflanking maneuver and his pinning force comprised of just this single core here, if the Austrians can defeat this pinning force before the outflanking core arrive, the French will lose the battle and have to retreat. Now, if both players select the outflank chit, then there's no splitting of the forces and everybody is going to fight uh, together. If nobody picks an outflank chit, you also ignore this step. Now, once you've determined whether or not an outflanking chit has been selected, both players will reveal what they actually chose. This chit selection process is nothing more than a glorified rock, scissors, paper. The choices that you select are going to be used to determine which combat results table you use for the combat for the upcoming rounds. And battles in Empires in Arms are fought in a series of rounds with up to three rounds per day of combat. What you'll do once the chit selection is made, if the Austrians decided to choose defend while the French, the attackers chose echelon, we would take these chits and consult the uh, operational possibilities chart or the tactical chart. Across the top here, you can see all of the options for the attacker to choose and down the side are the defender options. You simply cross index the defender option with the attacker, in this case, echelon and defend. And you'll see two lines here with some numbers. The top line tells you which tables the attacker is going to use, and the bottom line tells you which tables the defender is going to use. So you'll get a 1-3 or a 2-3 or 2-4 for the attacker. Once you've determined which tables are going to be used, you're going to slide over to the actual combat results table, and you can see here that the combat results table is a large grid. You have casualty level across the top and morale level down the side. The numbers that we were just looking at on the uh, tactical chart, the 1-3 or the 4-1, the first number indicates the casualty level, which tells you which column you're going to use. The second number after the dash tells you which morale level you're going to use or which row. So in the case of the echelon versus the defend, for the first round, the attacker is on the 1-3. That's the one casualty level, three morale level. He is going to roll on this chart here. He's going to roll 1d6 with some potential die roll modifiers. The defender is also going to roll. In his case, he's going to roll on the 4-1. So he's going to be on this column and the first row. So he's going to roll here. You can see each of these boxes We'll look at the 1-3, has two columns. The first one is the percentage of strength loss that is inflicted, and the second column is the uh, morale loss that is taken. After the chits are revealed, which may include a withdraw chit on the part of the defender, if the defender chooses the withdrawal, you may actually, there may be an automatic withdrawal 
or if he can roll less than his general strategic value, he may be able to withdraw without having to fight the battle. Once the withdrawal is determined, now you will reveal your forces, the total strength points, how much infantry, how much cavalry, how much total strength points are involved on each side, as well as calculating their morale level. Now, most infantry has a morale level of three. Most cavalry has a morale level of four. So if the French were to have a total of 10 infantry strength points at three morale and five cavalry strength points at a four morale, you would take three times 10 is 30 plus the five times four is 20. For a total of 50 divided by 15, that's going to give you a final force morale of 3.33, which is going to round up to 3.4. There are two ways to win a battle in EIA. The first way is to kill all of the opposing strength points. That's kind of hard to do unless the enemy is a small force. The second method is to inflict more morale loss on them than their starting force morale. So, for instance, if the um, French, with the attacker rolling on the 1-3 column here, rolls a modified 6, that's minus 2.3. If the Austrians had a starting morale of 3.0, at the end of the first round, their remaining morale would be 0 0.7, which means on the second round of combat, then any result that would inflict 0 0.7 morale loss or greater would break the Austrians. Once you have figured out the force morale and strength points of each force, we've determined which uh, combat chart we're using. Both sides will roll a die. That can be modified by the leader tactical ratings. In this case, we have the defender, John, who has a tactical rating, the middle number of a one, going up against Marshal Sewell, who has a tactical rating of three. So the attacking commander's tactical rating is three. You cross-index that with one, and you'll see that the uh, white portion of the square indicates the die roll modifier for the attacking player, and the gray shaded portion of the square indicates the die roll modifier for the defender. In this case, the French would add zero, but the Austrians would need to subtract one from their die roll when they rolled the dice on the respective combat chart. After you roll the dice, you will inflict the losses and you will determine whether or not uh, one side has uh, defeated the other. If neither side has broken or been eliminated, we will move on to the second round of combat. Now, after the first round of combat, before you begin the second round, there is a possibility that if you have chosen an outflanking tactic, that the outflanking force will arrive. They will arrive if you roll equal to or less than your commander's strategic rating, which in Sewell's case is a three. And if they do arrive, they usually will hit the uh, uh, enemy like a hammer. So outflanking can be a very powerful maneuver in the right circumstances and um, can really devastate uh, enemy forces. But it is a bit of a risky decision because your flanking force may in fact not end up arriving in time. Now, also, while you're checking to see if the outflanking force arrives, you can also see if there are any other nearby core that may reinforce the battle. Core of both sides that are in adjacent areas can roll, if they have a leader, the strategic value or less in order to successfully join the combat. So in this case, after that first round of uh, combat, Bernadotte wishes to join the action. He would need to roll a two or less in order to arrive on the field. And he would add his strength points to Sewell's strength points. Now he would, he would assume the morale of the army that started there. So you, you're not gonna recalculate any of the, uh, any of the morale levels. And then you would continue with the second round and then on to the third round if necessary. Now, at the end of the third round, that would complete the first day of combat. At the end of each day of combat, each side has an opportunity to just to withdraw from the battle. Once a force is defeated, if it breaks, meaning its morale breaks, it'll be forced to retreat. 
the, the winning force has an opportunity to pursue the broken force and inflict even more casualties on them. That's going to be based on how long the combat lasted and how uh, big a morale hit the winners suffered during the fight. And the losses to the enemy are going to be based uh, primarily on the amount of cavalry strength points in the winning force and only the cavalry strength points. So in order to pursue the enemy and inflict what can be a considerable number of uh, losses on them, you're going to want to have a lot of cavalry, or as much cavalry as you can. When an army uh, loses and uh, suffers their pursuit losses, they are then retreated into a neighboring and adjacent uh, area of the victor's choice. That's really a, uh, like I said, a simple, straightforward, almost summary of how the combat works in, uh, in EIA. And once you actually witness a battle or two occur in a game, you will understand it. It'll, it'll make sense how it flows. And it really is, like I said, it, it, it can be one of the more interesting and exciting parts of the game. Uh, a high quality force that's small may be facing a larger, lower morale force. And it's always interesting to see if the smaller force, the more elite force, can break the morale of the larger army before the larger army just completely swarms the uh, uh, smaller force out of existence. Now let's talk about sieges. Now, in this example, supposing that uh, John decided to withdraw inside the city of Stuttgart and the French besieged him, the French would have the option to either just sit there besieging him and wait for the Austrians to eventually um, run out of food and starve to death by failing their forage rolls. Their other option would be to attempt to assault the, uh, the city or the fortress. If they choose to do that, that occurs after all of the field battles in the land combat step have occurred. And you need to go over to the siege table here. And you can see right here that the attackers are going to roll one die. They are going to subtract the siege value, which is the number of flèches on the city. So in the case of Stuttgart, which is not a fortress, just a regular city, that would be zero. If the, de if the defenders do not have enough strength points in the city or fortress, the attacker will get to add plus one to his die roll because it'll be considered to be under garrisoned. What is that level? They have to be within five of the maximum capacity. So with Stuttgart's capacity of 15, if the Austrians were to have nine or fewer strength points in the city, they would be considered under garrisoned and the French would get a plus one. There are three results that you can see. There's sortie, NR for no result or a breach. On a no result, Neither side makes an attack and the siege simply continues. On a sortie, this is up to the defender. He can choose to uh, sortie some of his defenders and one die is rolled. On a one through four, the besieger, the French in this case, would lose one factor. On a five or six, the defender would lose one factor. If the final result is a plus four to a plus seven, however, a breach has occurred. When a breach occurs, the defender, in this case the Austrians, may ask for the honors of war. If the besieger grants the honors of war, all of the forces that are inside the city are simply moved to a nearby uh, Austrian-controlled city. If the French deny the honors of war, then the Austrians have the option of just surrendering everybody, including all the leaders, to the French, and they would become prisoners of war until exchanged at the end of the war. Or, if the Austrians choose not to surrender, there will be an assault. This will be an attack lasting three rounds, and only three rounds, and each side will use either the 5-1 or the 5-2 combat results table. So, that's the five casualty and one morale for the, uh, for the besieging force. The defending force would roll on the five casualty, two morale. And the way these combat charts are laid out, the higher the number on the casualty level, the greater number of casualties are likely to be inflicted. You can see on the five column here, even on the five one, you can inflict up to 20% of your force's strength points in casualties on the enemy. Whereas if you're over here on the one column here, it's zero or five. So much less bloodier when you're on the left side of this chart. 
Same thing with morale. The lower morale numbers are not going to inflict as big a morale hit on the enemy as down here where you're looking at the five. So a five five is both the bloodiest and will inflict the most morale losses on, uh, on the enemy. So after three rounds, if the defender has not uh, been defeated, if his morale has not been broken or all his strength points eliminated, the siege will resume. If the defender, or yes, if the besieger wins, then uh, either by eliminating all of the strength points or by breaking the defender's morale, all of the remaining strength points and leaders of the defenders, if any, will become prisoners. Now, you can also attempt to relieve a besieged force by having a relieving force move into the area during your movement, in which case the relieving force can attack in conjunction with the besiegers at the same time. And you would again fight a limited field battle that will last three rounds. This time you would be choosing your tactical chits and consulting the uh, combat charts. At the end of the third round, if the relieving force has not won, then they will have to retreat and the siege uh, remains in place. Now, you don't need a relieving force in order to try to fight your way out. At any time when it's the uh, besieged player's uh, turn to go during their combat step, they can attempt to make a um, defender attack out of the fortress. And it works exactly like a, a, an assault by the besieger, except the tables are reversed. The defender would roll on a 5-1 and the attacker or the besieging force would be rolling on the 5-2 column. Now, you heard me talk about percentages, uh, loss percentages that are inflicted. Those are a percentage of your force that you inflict on the other army. So if the French had a strength of 60 strength points, and they inflicted a 20% loss on the Austrians, you would come to the casualty percentage table here, find the 20% row, you would go across 20, that's four steps, that goes into 63 times, which means a total of 12 steps. So the French would inflict 12 steps on the Austrians. It's important to remember that the percentage loss is not a percentage that you suffer of your own forces, it's based on the size of your army, and it's what you inflict on the other guy. That's kind of a quick and dirty guide to the combat here. There are a few little uh, details that, uh, that you can figure out once you actually sit down at the table and take a closer look at the charts. Where the game gets, I don't wanna say complicated, but what you're gonna to wanna to do is eventually through experience and looking at the chart, kind of study how the various tactical chits interact with one another and figure out which one is better against which other type of, uh, of chit. But that'll come with experience. For now though, you've seen all of the steps involved in, um, in resolving combat in, in EIA. There aren't a lot of combats every turn. As uh, you may remember, most of the uh, nations in the game have uh, less than less than 12 or 15 core counters. And it's the core counters that are doing most of the moving and fighting. Your garrisons are just random strength points that happen to be sitting in cities. So it's a fairly low counter density game, which is good for people uh, who are new to it. You're not overwhelmed having to keep track of, you know, a hundred different uh, counters that you're moving across the map. Uh, once the... Um, combat step is completed, you're pretty much done with the turn and it will advance the turn marker into the next month and you'll go back to the political phase and the diplomacy step, except every third month. That would be March, June, September, and December where you will have an economic phase. So let's talk about the economic phase real quick and then that's gonna pretty much wrap up this, uh, this little tutorial. First step in the economic phase is to record your victory points in the victory point step. And this is what we talked about a little earlier with the political status display. In this instance, you would simply record the victory points located at the top of the box on the track that you are in and add those to your total down at the bottom. Now, Britain has a special ability. She can spend up to one third of her, the victory points she would normally gain this economic phase and instead choose one 
other major power and subtract the same number of victory points from that power. So for example, she's in the box here where she would be awarded eight victory points normally. Great Britain can spend up to two of those points against any one other major power, let's say France, and subtract two points from the total France would receive. So instead of receiving nine, France would get only seven victory points in this uh, example, and Great Britain would gain six instead of eight. Once the uh, victory points are recorded, we will then collect our money and manpower, and that is based on the controlled territories that you have. Now, any province whose capital contains an unbesieged enemy core counter will not generate any revenue for you. It won't generate any revenue for the bad guys either. This is a game where um, you can control an area or a province, but you don't own it, if that makes any sense. Players who have played the um, computer game Europa Universalis will understand this idea. So if the enemy controls some of your territory while the war is ongoing, they essentially are going to deny it to you, but they will not gain any benefits of it until and unless it is formally ceded to them and becomes part of the territory they permanently control, at least until the next war when you take it back. Now, once you collect your money and manpower, we get to the manipula manipulation step. If there is an enemy core in your capital, you are unable to collect any money whatsoever this turn. And that's bad because it means no money or no additional money for the next three months because this economic phase, remember, occurs only once every three turns. There are a couple of other little uh, odds and ends. Uh, for instance, Spanish have a, um, a, a gold convoy that arrives once a year. Uh, the uh, British have trade both with ports in Europe as well as with the Americas. And those are details that you can look into once you um, uh, show up for, for the game. Uh, the main thing is to remember, first we're gonna collect our victory points, then we're gonna collect our money and manpower. Once you collect the money and manpower, now you get to spend it. You have to spend money to pay maintenance for each core marker that's on the map and each fleet marker. Now, this is just for the marker. It doesn't matter if there's one infantry strength point in that core or if there are 25 strength points in that core. You're going to pay the same amount for each core that is on the map in order to uh, maintain them. And that is $1 each. For fleets... Fleets, if they are in port, they also cost a dollar. If they're at sea, they cost five. If they're in a blockade box, they only cost three dollars. Now, once you've paid your maintenance for both your cores and your fleets and your depots, because depots also cost a dollar, you then have to pay off any formal debts. These would be debts due to formal peace treaties where you're obligated to pay one third or one half of your income to uh, the guy that just beat you. Then, any money remaining after that, you can spend to build more troops. And let's take a look at, uh, at the purchase and cost chart for that. Here we see the purchase and cost chart on the play aid. It lists all of the maintenance costs you can see here, as well as how much each of the different types of uh, strength points, and be they land factors or ships. Cavalry factors are the most expensive at $15 each, and they require two manpower. Over here in the far right column, it shows you how long it takes to build those particular uh, factors. So even though we're doing uh, the purchasing now, it's going to take time to train and assemble those troops or build those ships. If we are in the March turn of the uh, year, if we were to build an artillery factor, it's going to take six turns. It's not going to arrive until the reinforcement step of the September turn. You can see an infantry factor takes three turns to arrive, so that would be the June reinforcement turn. Militia are cheap. They cost no money. They do cost two manpower, and they will arrive next turn, so they'll arrive right away. Militia, though, you kind of get what you pay for. Their morale uh, value is much lower than your regular infantry, uh, your guard, or your cavalry factors. And for ships, they're expensive at $10 each, they do cost one manpower, and they take an entire year to complete. So losing ships at sea, it can take you a while to recover from that. Once 
all of you, once you've expended all of the money and manpower you wish to in building uh, new units and new troops, you can then also purchase new core and fleet counters at this time, and you will spend um, you will spend one dollar basically for the counter, and that will place an empty core counter or an empty fleet counter on the map, which you then will need to fill with at least one strength point in the ensuing reinforcement phase. Finally, after all of that, you're going to go back to the political status display, and we're going to adjust our political status here by moving the marker based on the number in the box it's located. So negative numbers are going to move you down the track and positive numbers are going to move you up the track. After that, it's the seating step. And the seating step is only used for players that are going to seed territories to another uh, player outside of a peace treaty. You can only seed provinces that are not part of your home country and you can only seed them to an ally. So say you came to a diplomatic agreement at one point that uh, Russia will agree to um, uh, declare war and come in against France to help Prussia, but she demands that Prussia, as part of the deal, will cede the province of Denmark to Russia. It's a perfectly legitimate, acceptable deal for the players to make, and this would be the point in time where the control of Denmark would officially transfer from Prussia to Russia. That doesn't happen terribly often in games, but it... Um, it does come up from time to time. After the seeding step, that's it. You're done, you're back to the next turn, you're into the political phase, and you're on to pursuing whatever wars that you have managed to get yourself into at this point. And that is Empires in Arms in a very large nutshell. Now keep in mind that there were some rules that I did not discuss in this video, so it is not a uh, comprehensive tutorial. Think of it more of a rules primer. Uh, there are rules such as Spanish guerrillas, Turkish feudal corps, leader casualties, things that uh, were not brought up because they either only apply to one of the major powers or they're a, they're a small rule that's quickly picked up during the course of play. And I'm trying to keep the um, video as short as feasible. So that's going to do it for today. I hope this was helpful. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you.